Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I spoke yesterday, so you may recognize me. Uh, I'm Paul Durant, uh, Principal Software Engineer at Citrix. Uh, my main responsibilities are PV drivers and virtual GPU, so this one's more aimed at the, the virtual GPU end of things. <clears throat> um, so the talk is entitled Multiple Device Emulators for HVM, so I guess that kind of gives away the approach we took. Um, but first I'd like to sort of discuss how, how emulation takes place. Uh, I'll then move on to where we started in our work with NVIDIA to bring virtual GP into Zen server. Uh, the current implementation, which is available in Tech Preview now, um, which will be shipping in product towards the end of the year. And then I'd like to sort of go on to where we expect to take the implementation and possible spin-offs from, uh, from what we've done. So emulation uh, done by basically trapping uh, I.O. port accesses, which cause explicit VM exits or page faults in MMIO regions. Um, some devices Zen emulates itself, so critical things like HPET, RTC are emulated in the hypervisor. But mostly uh, a trap like that will result in an I.O. rec data structure being built by Zen uh, and that being passed to keying you. Um, so that kind of gives you two options. Uh, for device emulation, if you want to add a new device, uh, you've either got to go with QMU or you've got to build it into Zen. So this is kind of just a slide of the general NVIDIA grid virtual GPU architecture. Um, the basic idea is that in Guest, um, the OS sees uh, an NVIDIA GPU. It looks like a piece of hardware. This has advantages because it means that you don't need a special driver. You can just use the NVIDIA standard hardware driver uh, to talk to the thing. Um, and actually, to be honest, underneath uh, what you've got essentially is a hardware GPU. It's just a slice of the actual real GPU. So I guess you can kind of think of this as SRIOV, um, but it's not actually SRIOV hardware. You need some software to make it work. Um, so yeah, the, the bits in DOM0, basically the kernel driver would normally be the physical function driver in SRIOV word, world, but essentially you've got this extra device model on top, which creates the, the, the virtualization layer for you, and you need an emulator to, uh, to make that work. So <clears throat> how do we do it? Uh, well, there's a couple of options. Obviously, you could build it into Zen. Uh, this wasn't a particularly popular choice, because for a start, the code's closed source. We don't even get the source from NVIDIA. Uh, uh, so it's definitely not GPL, um, and it needs to coexist with the VJ implementation, which was in QEMU. So QEMU is obviously going to be the natural home. Uh, problem with putting it into QEMU is that it was basically a large patch to QEMU traditional, uh, and I mean quite big. Um, largely what it did was put its hooks all over the VGA code uh, and then create a binary plugin interface for the actual implementation, which as I said was closed source. Um, so. This probably wouldn't gain much traction upstream. Uh, it wasn't the sort of thing I looked forward to forward porting onto QEMU upstream. Um, and if we weren't actually going to be able to upstream it, then it was going to be a patch we'd have to carry in perpetuity uh, and would be generally pretty hard to rebase, I suspect. So we, yeah. we didn't like that approach either, so we kind of needed a third way. So some work that Julian Grohl had done in Zen Client um, was to come up with the idea of an IRX server abstraction. Um, so normally QEMU talks to Zen in a, using a variety of uh, HVM parameters um, and bits and pieces spread out all over the place. Uh, but if you, if you take that list of things that it needs, um, which is basically a shared page with a per CPU data structure for passing synchronous IRX from Zen to the emulator, and then another page which you can pass asynchronous IRX uh, from Zen to the emulator and an event channel to signal that, uh, that ring. Um, if you take all those things and hang them in the same data structure, then you can create this, this IRX server abstraction. And once you've done that, then you can have several of them. Um, so you stick them in a table, uh, and then when, when you take the, the VM exit to do an, em an emulation, you can basically go and look up where you want to send it. Um, so what we've got is a table that basically allows IOs to be steered according to port address ranges, MMIO address ranges, or a PCI bus device function number. Uh, the bus device function number steering is the hardest to do because you don't actually get an emulator uh, or a trap which has a bus device function number in it. In the x86 world, uh, PCI config space accesses, 
are done indirectly, so you get an address cycle that goes through the CFA port address, and then a, a data cycle which goes through CFC. So basically, you have to trap the CFA uh, right in Zen, uh, hold on to that information, and then when the CFC comes in, you, you steer it to the right place at that point. So what we did was put the necessary patches into Zen, which are pretty small on the whole. It's only, I don't know, maybe 100 lines of code. Not, not very much. Um, I patched QEMU to use the new IRX server abstraction, um, which was just you know, some extra library calls and zone control. Um, and then I created a new emulator from, from scratch, uh, which actually really wasn't very hard. I mean, my, my first stab at doing the secondary emulator was just a, a dumb PCI device with an IO bar and a MMIO bar. And I think that in total was about, well, less than 100 lines of code. It was pretty small. Um, but then I ported the code that NVIDIA had written in the QEMU patch uh, onto that emulator. So then we had a standalone emulator uh, that would emulate the, the, uh, the VGA device, or emulate the PCI device, uh, the PCI NVIDIA device. Uh, and then also I piled in um, uh, a VGA emulator into that, into that device model as well so that the two could talk to each other. The implementation is still in domain zero with all that lot though, um, which is obviously a bit concerning from a security point of view. Uh, given that we don't have access to the source, uh, we can't really audit it. All we can do is get security statements from NVIDIA uh, regarding that. So um, in future, I'd like to, to try to isolate it. Um, so I, I thought the, the best idea, given that we now have a separate emulator and that doesn't have to be in DOM zero, you could basically put that anywhere you like. Um, that we would go with a, a disaggregated solution, so we'd uh, create an appliance domain um, for VGP. We'd then pass through the physical GPUs to that domain, run the emulator in that domain, uh, which would then service the actual guest VMs. Uh, and then we'd need some console implementation. Now, the console implementation we have at the moment is a bit on the hacky side. Um, basically, what I did was, was create another graphics device model in QEMU, which really isn't a device model at all. Uh, all it does is render a console on top of the video RAM from the guest. Um, we split the video RAM up in a slightly funky way. Uh, the aperture is 16 megs wide, but what we do is I split it into 4 and 12. Um, so the video RAM we actually tell the guest, uh, it, we tell the guest it's got 4 megs of video RAM. Uh, and that means basically if it's in text mode or in a mode that's not 32-bit color depth, then we actually have software scrape that video RAM out and render an actual 32-bit color depth graphical console in the other 12. Uh, and then we map the, uh, the actual QEMU console over that. Uh, in the case where the guest is actually in 32-bit color depth, we put the QEMU console over the video RAM and it just goes out without any translation at all. That works very well. Uh, and then when you're actually uh, running the, uh, the NVIDIA device rather than emulating VGA, it DMAs a composite frame buffer 25 times a second into that video RAM. And so it, you, you just get a console automatically, basically. It was just an easy solution. Uh, but if we go with the appliance domain approach, then I'd, I'd probably go with a, a LibVNC-based console directly in the appliance domain. I think that would make more sense. Uh, although I don't, I've, I've not used LibVNC, so I'd, it's, there's still some investigation work to do there. Um, another thing that we did was patch Kimi. Um I believe we probably don't have to patch Kimi to make it work. So I'd like to come up with the idea of an IRX server that's basically a catch-all. Um, so we, have, we call it IRX server zero or something like that. You can talk to it using the old-fashioned HVM params uh, and you know, the standard interfaces. Uh, and if you don't have a secondary emulator that traps a particular I.O. range or a particular PCI device, then everything goes to a server zero and QEMU gets it by default, which is how it always works. So you don't need to change QEMU at all. So kind of possible spin-offs from, from having the ability to have secondary emulators as well. One of the things we've discussed in the past with Zen Server is the idea of the, the Windsor architecture, which is just disaggregation of driver domains, service domains, and Zen Server. Um, but obviously, one of the things you need to do is uh, still have emulated hardware for HVM guests that don't have PV drivers. Um, and so if you've got a QMU running in DOM0, as, as is traditional, and then you've got a, a driver domain actually with your network hardware in it. How do you get the I.O. from QEMU and DOM0 to the driver domain? Well, then you've got to build a PV path from DOM0 to the driver domain. So you've just increased the length of your, your, your emulated path 
Uh, and possibly the performance may even be so bad that you'd actually notice it, ab notice it above the actual overhead of emulating I.O. anyway. Um, it's certainly going to be more complicated to set up. So given the ability to have disaggregated emulation, it would make more sense to just have a standalone emulator for the network running in the actual network driver domain. Similarly, if you had storage, you'd have a, an emulator running in the storage driver domain. So yeah, maybe we can do that. Um, certainly, we already have a user space tap disk process, so it services the, as a, it serves as a PV backend, so we could just make it serve as an emulator as well. Uh, I'm sure it wouldn't be, actually be that hard. Um, one problem you have, though, obviously, when you have multiple emulators is the QEMU unplug protocol, which is a kind of a bit of a, a strange thing to drive. Um, when you bring up uh, a, an HVM Windows domain, for instance, you, you've got emulated hardware in there. Uh, it has to use the emulated hardware to boot to a certain level. Uh, but once you're up and running inside the kernel, you want to unplug that emulated hardware. So you, you write to some magic I.O. ports in Keymu and your un emulated hardware disappears. Uh, but obviously, if you've got, uh, well, th those I.O. ports are implemented by the Zen, actually the Zen platform PCI device, even though they're not actually part of the PCI device itself. But obviously, if that's running in one emulator and you've got your network emulate, your network backend running in a different emulator, the unplug is not going to work. Uh, so there's going to have to be some other way of doing it. Now, Julian already did some work um, in that, and um, he created disaggregated key news, um, which is probably what we'd want to use. Uh, but he, to, to, to make the unplug work, he pushed the emulation of the I/O ports down to Zen which I think is a good thing. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a natural way to do it. And then created an abstract unplug I.O. rec, which would then be broadcast to all emulators. And obviously, whoever was owning the network drivers, or network backends would unplug at that point. Whoever's owning the storage would unplug at that point. Um, but I'd kind of like to go a little bit further, maybe. Um, so one of the things I thought about was actually creating a new kind of first class interface in Zen. Um, so perhaps we could actually have HVM ops to do the unplugs. Obviously, we'd need to support legacy guests that didn't know about them. Um, so, but if you, know, if you had a new guest, perhaps you know, we, we should move to a new interface so that future front ends uh, know about these new hypercalls and we'll make these new hypercalls. And eventually, when the, the old, IO, uh, old front ends disappear, we can get rid of the old IO emulations. Uh, similarly, if we have patches into QEMU so that we can run full dis disaggregated QEMU, then we don't need to implement um, the unplugging key using the old-fashioned uh, IO port emulations. So we could have it understand these particular IO recs, and then we could potentially tell the front ends that you know, there is no catch-all emulator there, you don't have to use a legacy mechanism. And we can maybe unplug, rather than just by net or disk class, we could perhaps look at unplugging individual discrete devices, which is actually very useful from a Windows point of view, where you may want to run one emulated device and one PV device. We certainly find that useful in trying to, uh, to run logo test, for instance, where uh, if you have the same driver for all your disks, Windows happily offlines it and then blue screens because your system, this system disk's gone away. Um, so that, that's kind of a future idea. Um, actually, I forgot to click through the slide there. But I'll uh, now attempt to move on to a demo. So this may not work because the, uh, the network's been a bit flaky of late. But this is a host I've got an NVIDIA K2 in back home, which is two GPUs. And I just like to try starting it up so you can see the emulator in action. So you get a bit of noise out of Zenstall when the tool stack talks to it. Obviously, the font's a bit, a bit lousy there. I don't know if I can increase that a bit. Um, turn Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, the network's still on the lock up on me. Yeah, I was afraid this might happen. But you can basically see the emulated VGA is rendering a VNC console. Zen, Zen Center doesn't know anything about virtual GPU in this version, so it's still telling you it's got to be a GPU assigned, and you better use RDP to talk to the guest, even though you, you don't actually need to. Um, but if the network is still alive in any way, now that the VM's up, we might be able to log into it over ICA. Now, this is a host that's running in the lab back in Cambridge, and I'm talking to it over the VPN over a Wi-Fi network from Edinburgh. Um, so the bandwidth isn't great, but ICA is actually surprisingly usable. 
Um, you'll probably notice some, like, you know, uh, H264 uh, artifacts on it, but basically it's there. Um, and we may even be able to actually kick off the Heaven benchmark and get some meaningful interface out of it. It takes a little while to load now. I mean, the, the actual framework we're going to see is nowhere near what the application is actually going to be rendering it. It has an FPS counter in the top right, which will tell us actually what, what it's doing. Uh, but we're probably only seeing about, what, 10 to 15 frames at best, probably, per second. The NVIDIA virtual model limits the frame rate at around 60. Um, but what Sorry? Yeah, the default settings, yeah. So, take a little while to round put now, but you should be able to see the FPS counter in the top right start to increase. So, you, yeah, I mean, see, we're, we're seeing massive dropouts occasionally as the network congestion hits us, but you can see it's basically doing that around 50 odd frames a second. And that's using uh, a device model which uh, gives you a quarter of a K2 GPU. So, using that device model on all your VMs, you basically get eight VMs on that particular card because it's got two physical GPUs on it. So yeah, I'll leave that running and, uh, and take any questions. So, um, have you considered, you've got your multiple I.O. requests thing. Yeah. Um, my I/O request providers, which, mm -hmm. which sounds cool. Um, have you considered changing QMU to explicitly register? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I think. I mean, I would advocate doing the, the catch-all thing for obviously QMU compatibility, uh, because we want this to work with potentially with older QMUs um, without modification necessarily, because you know this is a a distinct emulator for use, but in future, yeah, we would like to use multiple key MUs, and once we're going down that route, we, they would need to explicitly register their I.O. ranges, so we would have to add the code to key MU to do that. But it would mean that you could take another old key MU from a distro, and you would still be able to use it as a, as a single emulator. Okay, um, and I have a kind of follow-up question, which mm -hmm. is, with respect to the unplug protocol, mm -hmm. um, if you, because they're, they're all rights, these unplug requests. They are. Um, so, in principle, you could have some kind of snooping I.O. request registration where each QMU would say, well, I, I need to know about these rights, but I don't care about saying whether they've succeeded or not. Yes, ind indeed, you could do that, but since you are potentially going to the trouble of registering explicit I.O. ranges in QMU and making modifications anyway, why wouldn't you just add an extra I.O. rec at that point, say, I'll listen to unplug I.O. recs? They're kind of neater. You may be able to build more functionality into them in the future. Well, I, I, if I were a hypervisor maintainer, I wouldn't want that weird shit in the hypervisor, I think. Is the well, I mean, the, the, the old I.O. ports here, are, are basically, and so that's why I suggest adding new HVM ops to make it more explicit. I think just putting the old I.O. ports there is just a legacy thing we potentially have to support. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't want to add any more to that interface than is already there. Uh, I'd prefer to replace it with something much better. Okay. Uh, I don't have a question per se, but I have already done exactly what you suggested to Julian's IRX server patch so that it has a catch-all, mm -hmm. and it's currently in the Zen client tree and it's shipping in the current version of Enterprise, so okay, cool. just grab it. <laughs> Actually, I should also point out just uh, that, yeah, I, I asked you about the translate uh, hypercall yesterday. Well, uh, we basically added the translate hypercall in to, to make this work as well. So I suggest we probably just put that back in upstream. <laughs> in the architecture where you have the service VMs, uh, one for example for network, one for yeah. disk, and you run uh, the network backend in network service VM and the, mm -hmm. the network emulator. There. Yeah. So do you have a way to restrict um, somehow the uh, operations of the emulator or you can just map any random page of the machine? Because otherwise from yeah, I mean, at the moment, yes. Uh, obviously, the, the emulator does run in DOM0. It can map any old page it likes in the machine. We'd probably have to come up with some mechanism to restrict that. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that would look like, look like yet. <laughs>
Um, but yes, some, some sort of policy would uh, definitely be the right way to go. Um, do you know why NVIDIA is not using an SRIOB approach? Um, my suspicion is it's just expense. Uh, I mean, SRIOB is going to cost you in silicon uh, to implement that stuff. Uh, there's probably a whole load of compliance stuff you have to go through to make SRIOB work. So, so why would you? Uh, basically, I mean, you, you can do the job with an emulator that's actually pretty small. And also, having an emulator there has advantages. At the moment, none of this stuff can, can be migrated uh, because the, there's no actual no way. Yeah, the network's gone. Uh, there's actually no way of sucking out the state and replaying it into new hardware, but you could envisage doing that with an emulator. Essentially, most of the state's held in the guest anyway, so all you're, all you're doing is taking the register state, which you've got in the emulator anyway, um, packaging that up, shipping it somewhere else, and then basically as long as you can replay that into another virtual instance and then so, say go and start reading the DMA key from the guest again, uh, then potentially you could migrate this. With SRIOV, it's not clear how you do that. Um, which kind of uh, NVIDIA card uh, will support this technology? Um, at the moment, so it's just the, the grid K1 and K2s. If I can actually get this network to talk again. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't know, price-wise, price, price wise, um, what sort of cheap end of it is. I mean, the, the K1s are cheaper than the K2s. Um, they have, they actually have four GPUs on the K1s, but they're, they're smaller, lower power uh, GPUs. Um, but if I run... Uh, okay, I was just curious if it was something, you know, mainstream, yeah, and the chill, card yeah. there was just... Uh, Actually, if I, Something new. if I go in on the console, maybe that will work better. So at least I can show you. Yeah, if I just run uh, NVIDIA SMI, which is NVIDIA's little sort of tool, um, then, yeah, you can kind of see what you've got there. Uh, so, yeah, you've got, there's actually two, two grid K2s in there, so there's, there's two GPUs on each, and you can see the, the VGP process running out in the bottom there. I mean, another thing is that, you know, whilst that, that heaven's going, if I run top, you can see, you should be able to see the VGA process appear eventually. Um, but actually, no, I mean, it, 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 it's really not using very much CPU. I mean, once you're up and running, you've basically given a slice of the hardware to the guest. It set up all the mappings. It really doesn't have much, much to do at that point. It's all done by the hardware. Okay, we done? I think we're done.